live from the CBS 6 studio in Richmond, Virginia, The People's Debate, sponsored by AARP Virginia. Now, tonight's moderator, Bill Fitzgerald. Good evening and welcome to tonight's socially distanced debate between the Democratic and Republican candidates for one of Virginia's seats in the U.S. Senate. We are live on CBS 6 and WTBR.com and the debate is being simulcast on WTKR in Norfolk, WSET in Lynchburg, WCAV in Charlottesville, and WJLA 24-7 News in Washington. Let's meet the contenders. Joining us this evening are former Virginia governor and current U.S. Senator, Democrat Mark Warner, who is seeking his third term in Washington. His Republican challenger, Dr. Daniel Gade, is a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel who is now a professor at American University. Let's go over the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will get a two-minute opening and closing statement, the order of which was determined by a coin flip. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to each question. After those exchanges, the first candidate to respond will get 60 seconds for a rebuttal. Any additional rebuttal time will be offered in a fair way at my discretion as moderator. Questions will be asked by me and by our two esteemed panelists. Joyce Williams is the state president of AARP Virginia, and my colleague Reba Hollingsworth is the co-anchor of CBS 6 this morning. Because of COVID-19 restrictions, Joyce is appearing live from Roanoke via Zoom and Reba in a separate studio. There is no studio audience. As decided by our coin flip, Dr. Gade will give the first opening statement. Dr. Gade, good evening. Well, good evening, uh, Bill, and good evening, AARP. Thank you for hosting this debate. I'm thrilled to be with you and to be with uh, Virginia's 1.1 million people above the age of 50 who are members of AARP. Thanks for hosting. I'm a career servant. I joined the United States Army when I was 17 years old to support and defend the Constitution. Then I graduated from West Point and went off to do Army things. And when I was a captain, company commander in, in Iraq, I was wounded in combat twice and decorated for valor. The second time I was wounded, I lost my entire right leg at the hip. And so I had to remake myself. I went and got a master's degree and a PhD in public policy. I worked in the Bush administration doing veterans policy, military health care, and national level disability policy. Later, I taught at my alma mater, the United States Military Academy. And after I retired, I went to work in the Trump administration as a political appointee at Department of Labor, helping veterans find jobs. So when I say that you can trust me, when I say that I have your best interest at heart and that I will keep Virginia safe, you can trust that I know what I'm talking about. The problem is that far too often we have career politicians who won't keep us safe. I like Mark Warner, we've met several times. He's perfectly nice. The problem is, as a career politician, he voted against COVID relief that would have brought needed relief to Virginia families, including $266 billion for paycheck protection. He also voted, he, he, he's running an ad right now that says he's for reducing insulin prices, when in fact he took $600,000 from big pharmaceutical companies. And lastly, during this campaign, he said again and again that he's not with his party as they try to defund the police. And yet, as governor, he voted, he, he put in a budget that defunded the police by almost $50 million in 2002, and crime rates went up. The problem with career politicians is they go to Washington and they lose their way. And I'm sad to say that that's what we have right now in Mark Warner. We can do better, and I'm hoping to earn your vote on November 3rd. Thank you, sir. Senator Warner, your opening statement. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you also to the AARP. I'm going to start by saying a special shout out to all of the frontline essential workers and a particular mention to our postal workers who are obviously doing enormous work under struggling times. I know we're going to have our differences tonight um, between me and Mr. Gade, but I do want to start by thanking Mr. Gade for his service and his sacrifice uh, to our country. And Mr. Gade, I'll even make you a, a deal at the front end of it. A fly lands on your head, I'll tell you, and maybe agreed. vice versa. All right? Perfect. I agree. Agreed. We all know these are challenging times for Virginia and our country. You know, I spent over 20 years in business, creating jobs here in Virginia. I then went into public service because I wanted to get stuff done. And to do that, you got to work together. When I was governor, Virginia was named the best managed state and the best state for business. As your senator, I've been proud that 55 of my bills have become law. Bills that cut red tape for small business, that invested in shipbuilding in Hampton Roads, that improved Medicare. And just last month, in August actually, the president signed my legislation that made the largest investment in our national parks, 
that will also create 10,000 jobs right here in Virginia. But right now, our focus needs to be on saving lives and fixing our economy, and that means stopping the coronavirus. So rather than rushing through a Supreme Court nominee, the Senate ought to be back in session providing a comprehensive COVID relief bill because we need it. And as we pull through this crisis, and we will, we need leaders that are focused on making sure that Virginians will succeed in our new tech-driven economy. Because the truth is, those changes were happening even before the pandemic. And that's been the focus of my entire career. Because the real issues aren't red versus blue, but future versus past. And I believe so strongly in Virginia's future. It has been the honor of my life to serve Virginia. And I hope to earn your vote again. Thank you, sir. And Senator Warner, the first question goes to you. The coronavirus pandemic has caused an unprecedented health and economic crisis that's impacting people all across the Commonwealth and the country. As of this very moment, as you just referenced, Democrats and Republicans have disagreed on what the next stimulus package should look like. Yet, the question is, do both sides bear responsibility for not making this deal happen when so many economists, including the Fed chair, say it is crucial at this point in the recovery? Well, the Fed chair, Bill, is right. We need to do the biggest package possible because otherwise the economy will be in a tailspin for the foreseeable future. And the truth is it didn't have to be this way. I remember back in January, I wrote the Trump administration before there was a single case of COVID in Virginia, saying, do you need additional help? And instead, from this administration, we got a, an approach that blew off any national plan for testing, didn't even put in place a national plan for PPE, masks, which, by the way, my opponent has called wearing masks a sign of tyranny. I think it's a sign of respect. And now we do need to find compromise. The Trump administration, I think, has moved dramatically. They're close to $1.8 trillion in relief. The, um, the House Democrats were at 2.2. As somebody who's spent a career trying to get DS making deals, um, I think there is a, a compromise to be made. But what we shouldn't do, what we shouldn't do is what my opponent has suggested, which would be a rubber stamp for Mitch McConnell's approach, where he put up a bad bill a few weeks ago, a bill that was less than one third of even what the Trump administration had proposed, a bad bill that would have sold out Virginia's teachers, firefighters, um, folks, airline workers, you name it, because it didn't go far enough. We need to go big, or as the president said, go big or go home. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gade? Well, I agree. Coronavirus is a, is a once in a lifetime, hopefully once in a lifetime challenge, certainly once in a generation. And what we've seen with 220,000 220, Americans dead is that coronavirus needs decisive action now. But what you've just heard is a political, a politician's explanation for why he can't get stuff done. As a matter of fact, this bill that was put forward by Mitch McConnell about two months ago should have been passed. It would have passed with bipartisan support, but Mark Warner voted against it. I want to talk about one of the provisions in the bill. One of the provisions in the bill would have offered $100 billion or so to schools to help keep them open and help practice all of the extra things that are required to, to keep our students safe. And just today, we've seen the results in Virginia of shooting down that bill. The result in Virginia is that now our schools are all of a sudden closed. Our governor has announced today that he's closing all the public schools. And that hits our families tremendously hard, not just students, especially students with disabilities, who I've worked with for many years, but also most families that have to struggle with two parents working, and now we don't have a bill that kept our schools open, and you can lay that at the feet of none other than Mark Warner. Because when he, when he says he's gonna work across the aisle, what we really see is him retreating into his partisan positions. He votes with his party 95% of the time when it's not an election year, and he gets bipartisan only in an election year. Thank you, sir. Senator? Virginians know my record. They know my record as governor, when as a Democrat with a two-to-one Republican legislature. We made record investments and we were named best managed state, best state for business, best state to receive a public education. All records I'm proud of, of working together. But what I won't be, I'll never be a rubber stamp for Mitch McConnell. The remarkable thing about what Mr. Gage has said is he supported a bill that not all, even all the Republicans supported. He supported a bill 
that was less than one third of what President Trump has proposed. He is calling for a bill that would have provided no additional relief for state governments, for local governments. That would have cost. And now we don't have, have any relief. Firefighters, for the teachers, last two months, we've cops, had no relief jobs. because you voted that no. That would have cost airlines, workers who uh, need the additional assistance. That would have not provided the kind of needed assistance for our schools, for the PPE, so they can reopen safely. Now, I'm not going to vote for a bad bill. I think there ought to be a compromise. I've got that record of putting bipartisan deals together. Matter of fact, the first COVID relief bill, I was proud to have negotiated with Secretary Mnuchin, Thank you. where we did record $2.2 trillion investment. Thank we need that kind of investment again to get the virus behind us and get our economy Thank reopened. Senator. The next question is for Dr. Gade, and it comes from Joyce Williams with AARP. First, let me say, on behalf of Jim Dow, our AARP Virginia State Director, the hundreds of AARP volunteers, and the more than one million AARP members here in the Commonwealth, thank you both for accepting our invitation and participating in this people's debate. Dr. Gade, the coronavirus has left a devastating impact on families claiming the lives of more than 84,000 residents and staff of nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. This includes half of all the lives lost to COVID-19 in Virginia. Half of all Virginians who have died from COVID lived and worked in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. Americans 50 plus and others in need of long-term care face a patchwork of public and private services, costly institutional care, and rely on unpaid family caregivers. If elected, how will you work to improve our long-term care system and support family caregivers? Well, thank you. I've, I've worked, Joyce, I've worked on that question for many years, actually. I was a board member on the National Council on Disability, and like seniors, people with disabilities live with the need for long-term care uh, throughout their lives, in some cases from birth uh, throughout the natural life course. And so I've seen the opportunities that are available with long-term supported services, LTSSs, where we can use Medicare Part A and Part B funding to provide, to, to give people the in-home care that allows them to keep their dignity instead of being put in places, instead of being uh, warehoused in these institutions, which as you properly pointed out, during COVID and especially famously or infamously in New York, those institutions became death traps for far too many people who were exposed to COVID. So as we, as we modernize Medicare, which everybody agrees needs to happen, we need to be looking at ways to provide those care, the, all that care that we, as much care as we can in home. And that goes not just for seniors, but also for, for people with disabilities. But as you said, COVID obviously hits folks who are elderly much harder than it hits folks who are not. But it's also, as we know, it's hitting our minority communities especially hard. People who are poor are also hit hard. So as we expand all of these, or as we, as we look into the future, we need to be very careful to, to take care of those populations as well. Great question, Joyce. Thank you, Doctor. Senator? Well, Joyce, you're right. What's happened in our nursing homes is a tragedy. And we need more transparency about what's going on in our nursing homes. But again, it didn't have to be this bad. If we would have started with a national PPE strategy, if we had folks wear masks from the beginning, nursing home workers, again, my, my opponent says wearing masks is a sign of tyranny. I think it's a sign of respect. If we would have actually had an appropriate testing program in place like other industrial countries did, we would be better off. My opponent has said Donald Trump's done a great job on COVID. I think it's been an epic failure. Yeah, I agreed with Dr. Fauci when he said that same failure. thing in March. And the, and and the, the tyranny is, comment, let's talk about the tyranny me, sir, comment. Let, let me finish, finish my first. Please. You'll have 60 seconds. Thank and you. And the fact is, there's also a major difference, Joyce. You and I both know, and I appreciate AARP calling the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, a lifeline, an integral part of our health care system. My opponent wants to get rid of it. He's criticized me, he's criticized me on many things, for being one of the deciding votes. I think it ought to be fine ways to actually have it expanded to lower premium costs, to lower drug costs. Matter of fact, though, and you know, Joyce, as well as I, that many of our seniors in Virginia, in nursing homes, rely on Medicaid as well as Medicare. 
And the fact is, my opponent said the expansion of Medicaid in Virginia, which helped 400,000 Virginians get health care coverage, was like giving a child a cookie. That is extraordinarily disrespectful. For those seniors who are worried about Medicaid and making sure they've got that protection, the choice is clear. One person wants to build on the ACA, the other person wants to have this kind of wild repeal and replace plan, which we've seen for the last four years. There's plenty of repeal, but there's no legitimate replacement you, plan in place. You have 60 seconds, sir. Well, great. Like, like 2014, uh, Mark is going off the same talking points that he's always gone off. As a matter of fact, I've never called for the repeal of the ACA in total, and I think that the Republicans who do so are making a mistake because they're just trying to kick the can down the road for their own political advantage, as Mark Warner is doing right now with his uh, nonsense that he just made up. I'm for protecting people with pre-existing conditions. I will always be for protecting people with pre-existing conditions, and I will never, ever vote for a bill that doesn't do that. And I called it... <laughs> The idea, the idea that I called giving Medicare uh, to, to people, like giving a mouse a cookie or whatever nonsense he said, child a cookie, is absurd. What I was actually referring to is when you give states free money, of course they're going to take it. That's one of the problems that the ACA did is force states to make those kinds of choices. There's plenty of room to modernize and upgrade the ACA. We, I agree that we need to do that. But what you've just heard is a bunch of nonsense, and I hope you'll fact check it. All right, thank you, sir. Our next question is for Senator Warner, and it's from Reba Hollingsworth. Well, Senator Warner, COVID-19 has infected and killed people of all races, but state health leaders say it has hit black and Latino Virginians the hardest. Many of these communities historically don't have the same access to quality health care as others. What can be done on Capitol Hill to improve this? Well, Reba, I want to answer that because it's an extraordinarily important question, but my opponent made a bunch of false statements there that just need to be responded to. It's quite clear what he said about expansion of Medicaid. He opposed it, and 400,000 Virginians health care on the line. Is this when I was in the legislature, line. or when? 400,000 Virginians health care on the line. And on the question of protections for people with pre-existing conditions, my daughter's a type 1 diabetic. This is extraordinarily important to me. And please don't take my word for it in terms of the, the watching public. If there was a way for a magic wand to pick the good things out of the ACA and get rid of everything else, Donald Trump or somebody else would have come up with that plan. But the truth is, don't believe me, don't believe Mr. Gate, believe the AARP, believe the Diabetes Society, believe the Cancer Society. You can't take, without the market reforms around ACA, you can't take the good things and cherry pick. You can't have a magic wand. We've seen that not to be the case. In terms of the disparity with black and brown populations, the dis healthcare, uh, the COVID attack in healthcare has demonstrated uh, remarkably. ACA is one of those protections. But in addition, we need to do more in terms of chronic care. One of the issues, and again, disproportionately African Americans have felt this brunt. A bill that I made into law, the Chronic Care Act, with my Republican partner, Orrin Hatch, helps navigate those most sick seniors in terms of putting and focusing team-based approach more telehealth, that is one of the opportunities that, it, that actually has come out of COVID, although we need broadband universally, and particularly black and brown communities have suffered from that. And I'll, I'll get my uh, additional time after Mr. Gates finished, but this issue is extraordinary. 90 seconds, sir. Great. Well, Reba, I'll, I'll answer your question directly. Um, obviously, black and brown communities have been hit extremely hard by COVID, and that's absolutely true. And we talked about that at length at the Norfolk State debate last week, which I greatly enjoyed. What we need, though, is, of course, any, any modernization of the ACA, any time we look at these provisions, we need to continue to protect people with pre-existing conditions. And I'm not for cherry picking. I'm not for waving some magic wand. I agree with Mark when he says, don't believe him. But I'm not for, I'm not for uh, a, a, some, kind of, some kind of magical repeal bill that doesn't exist. I will always protect people with pre-existing conditions. The chronic care stuff is exactly right. And what we really need to do is we need to protect our poor communities and people who are most vulnerable during this, during this uh, pandemic. And that includes things like the Paycheck Protection Plan, things like Search for a Vaccine, which will be given primarily and in, in first to people who are most at risk, and, and things like <clears throat> helping our schools that are in, in, in areas where they need more help to get the help they need. And you know what would have done that? The COVID relief bill, which Mark Warner voted no for two months ago. 
Now he says it wasn't good enough, he says it wasn't big enough, but only in Washington is letting your constituents have nothing because you didn't get the perfect thing that you want, only in Washington is that excuse good enough because anywhere else it would be laughed out of the room and career politicians do this all the time. 60 seconds. Reba, let's, let's talk specifically not only about what we should do, but what I've done. You know, I was proud to have been on the board of Virginia Union, one of our HBCUs. Proud of the fact that I started in the 90s, long before I'd run for anything, the Virginia High Tech Partnership, to get kids from those HBCUs into high tech jobs. And if we can get more people of color into the medical profession, black docs, black nurses, other folks in the medical profession, that will help around disparity issues. We need to make sure right now that as we move towards a vaccination, and I've been in contact with all of the drug companies, to make sure that as we go into phase three trials, we've got appropriate representation because we of those patients in those phase three trials that look like the people getting sick. And Reba, the truth is, the bill that not only the Republicans didn't support would not have provided that additional assistance that was really needed for schools, for minority communities, for the kind of investment in particularly black owned businesses. And I've got again, bipartisan agreement with the Trump administration on my Jobs and Neighborhood Investment Act that will make meaningful investment into reopening the 440,000 black owned businesses that have been closed because healthcare disparity is tied to economic disparity. Thank you, sir. We can circle back. Uh, it seems like there's more to explore on the Affordable Care Act uh, from that last question that we asked. So I wanted to circle back and ask about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Dr. Gade, this question starts with you. Uh, you all were sparring last month uh, in Northern Virginia on that issue. Uh, you want to repeal it in a realistic way or repeal elements of it, no elements of it. Uh, what, what would you change then, and how is it that you can ensure people who are at high risk, those with pre-existing conditions, and the 500, almost 500,000 Virginians, for example, that got it through expansion of Medicaid, how do you bring those people and protect those people without causing premiums to go, go higher? Yeah, great. So again, I'm not for this, this nonsense idea that somehow we're gonna tear out the ACA root and branch. That might be a different Republican politician who's trying to gain some electoral advantage, but the truth is it's impossible to do and it wouldn't even be advisable if we could. The truth is what we need to do is there are parts of the ACA that we need to upgrade and there are parts that we need to keep. We need to keep the regulations that protect people with pre-existing conditions. 27 states had that before the ACA, certainly we can continue to do that. We also need to allow parents to keep their children, to keep their children on their health care plan until they're 26. That's a fine provision and should stay in, in effect. But there are a couple things that we must do as we move forward if we're serious, as I am, about controlling health care costs. We need to have health savings accounts that are much bigger than they are now and more generous in terms of their tax treatment. We need to have price transparency because price transparency allows patients and doctors to make good decisions about when to consume and what to consume. We need to have insurance that's able to be sold across state lines. And we need to have meaningful prescription drug reform that, that actually reduces the cost and keeps the access to high quality prescription drugs intact. And you can't trust somebody who's taken $600,000 from pharmaceutical companies, like Mark Warner has, to be the person who's somehow gonna be at the forefront of reducing prescription drug prices. So there's plenty of room to, to, to upgrade the ACA, and there's no room at all for just some kind of magical uh, repeal bill that he thinks that I'm for, and I don't even know where he got that. Senator, what about those tweaks that he has proposed? Are they those, are those viable cures for it? Mr. Gade spent the whole Republican nominating process criticizing me as being the deciding vote for ACA. You know, he, he criticized me repeatedly. You know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact the ACA, I'm proud that John McCain and I stood up against a repeal plan that would have cost three and a half million Virginians with pre-existing conditions the only law in the country that protects them, that would have protected the 400,000 Virginians who got coverage through Medicaid through the ACA. Now, if there was some magic health savings account or private market solution that was going to have this magic wand to protect all the good things in the ACA, wouldn't you think you would have heard about it by now? Wouldn't there have been some proposal? Wouldn't the AARP choice have said, here's a really good idea, let's do that instead? 
No, listen to the AARP. They said that ACA is a lifeline, an integral part of our health care system. What do we ought to do? In, in, I agree with actually Mr. Gate on this. As long as we got consumer protections, let's sell insurance products across state lines. And I've got legislation which is opposed by the whole pharmaceutical industry that would say, let's do in America what other industrial nations have done and allow the government to negotiate our Medicare drug prices. There's no reason why Americans should pay three, five, ten times more. I've been lucky enough to take care of my daughter in terms of surging insulin costs. But so many Americans don't have that same luxury. And if we strip away, strip away the ACA, if we don't make the drug Senator. reforms that are needed in terms of drug pricing, Thank you, Senator. we're not going to be able to correct this problem. Dr. Gay, do you have 60 seconds? Well, there's not much to respond to here, actually, because what we're looking at is, again, a career politician who's saying the only thing we can do is we can throw up our hands and stay with the status quo. The truth is many states have tried to experiment and to, to do workarounds with health savings accounts, and they work. Price transparency works. Selling insurance broadly and allowing people to buy into those policies works. But you know what doesn't work? Centralized government control. Now his party is for, now I don't know where he stands on this, but his party is for Medicare for all. They think that having government in control of all of our health care is going to make sense. I would suggest that anybody who believes that should go to a VA and sit there for a while and experience the waits, experience the delays, experience the far too often the low quality care that we've seen in our VAs. Because that's what socialized medicine looks like and that's what he's for. Now, He'll go with his party 100% of the time because that's what he does. All right. Thank you, sir. Now is a good time. We're going to stop for just a moment and take a, take a well, just we'll one moment. Back. You can come back. You can, you can I come have back never supported just, Medicare for all. We have I've been criticized a, repeatedly in my own party Senator, for that. We have to take Let a, the record stand. We have to take a commercial break right now. We will be back in 90 seconds with the second half of the People's Debate. Stick around. And welcome back to this special presentation of the People's Debate. We are joined by Senator Mark Warner and Dr. Daniel Gade. Our next question for Senator Warner comes from Joyce. We've uh, alluded to it a little earlier, or each of you has, um, but let's dive a little deeper into this Medicare issue. You know, Medicare is a crucial and more crucial than ever as Americans face this one-two punch of the coronavirus's health and economic consequences providing affordable health care for nearly 68 million Americans, 50 plus, and others with disabilities. How do you plan to protect and strengthen this important lifeline for older Americans? Yes. Well, Joyce, uh, I agree. Probably the two most important pieces of legislation passed in the 20th century were Medicare and Social Security. And we owe an obligation to not only the current recipients, but to all Virginians and Americans to make sure they're going to still be there. And the truth is, we can't keep kicking the can. I was part of an effort 
for a number of years to put in place a, a reform effort. We didn't get as far as we'd like because part of this is, as you know, Joyce, is just the math that changes. When I was a kid, there were 16 people working for every one person in retirement. Today, there are three people working for every one person in retirement. So what should we do? Let me tell you what I've already done. I passed the chronic care bill that looks at that 5% of our population that accounts for about 50% of our health care costs. If we can have better team management, if we can focus our expertise on those chronically ill people and make sure they get the medicines and treatments they deserve on a better case management system, we can lower costs and we can actually increase quality of care. This has been something, as you know, Joyce, I've been working on long before I was in elective office when I started the Virginia Healthcare Foundation back in the early 90s that's helped over a million Virginians get health care. We need to still be innovative. We need to actually make sure on both Medicare and Social Security that we review these programs on a 10-year basis because, as you know, Joyce, if we don't look at reforms, we're going to see the Medicare Trust Fund and, unfortunately, the Social Security Trust Fund go into arrears, and that will destroy the promise that needs to be kept to current recipients and future recipients. Dr. Gabe. Well, again, you know, career politicians have kicked the can down the road for far too long, Joyce. The Medicare situation and the long-term viability and funding of the Social Security program, which is, as you said, a vital lifeline for millions of Americans, those have been, those have been known problems for decades, decades. And when Mark Warner first ran in 1996, he said that he was for reforming Medicare. He said he was for reforming Social Security. And there were actually some reasonable proposals back there. But that was nearly 25 years ago. And what we've seen from then to now is no serious effort at reform. Now, there was a brief bright spot, Simpson Bowles, which Mark Warner was part of back in, when he first was elected to the US Senate in, in 2008. And the problem with and 8, 9, and 10 is kind of when that, that process went through. And then the process came to nothing because people lacked the political courage to look American voters in the eye and say this, these programs are vital. And if we don't get their funding mechanisms right, if we don't get their eligibility rules right, and if we don't get them on a path to sound financial footing now, then emergency surgery will be required later. Now, as somebody who's had many emergency surgeries, I know that that's traumatic and it will cause millions of people's lives to be disrupted. So we have to act, we have to act now, and career politicians, by the way, of both parties, including my party, have made mistakes on this, and it's time for new, fresh ideas on this. Senator? Joyce is, as you know, simply calling somebody a career politician over and over and over again. Doesn't change the facts. And making false accusations doesn't change the facts. The truth is, what I'm counting on the most is that Virginians know me, and they know my record. They know without my work, bipartisan work, there wouldn't be a chronic care act that would focus on these most sick individuals with two and three and four chronic illnesses that need the kind of team approach and ongoing monitoring that my legislation provided. It is the law of the land. They know that ACA, while not perfect, is the only law that protects people with pre-existing conditions. And those seniors on Medicaid who need, who are in nursing homes, two thirds of the seniors in nursing homes rely on Medicaid. My opponent wants to take that away. Is there more to be done? Yeah, we need to lower drug prices. And that means we need to give the government the power, as in other industrial nations, to negotiate for those drug prices. And that is what is gonna happen uh, if I get rehired. Thank you, Senator. The next question comes from Reba, and it is for Dr. Gade. Dr. Gade, before COVID-19, Virginia was facing another public health crisis, the opioid epidemic. The pandemic appears to have made things worse. A new study shows that VCU Medical Center right here in Richmond, it shows that we have seen a surge in patients admitted for opiate overdoses, a 123% increase from last year. How do we better combat the opioid crisis both now and when the coronavirus is over? Well, Reba, I appreciate that question and I'm gonna tell a very personal story. So when I was wounded in January 2005, I woke up in the hospital almost a month later and I had IV opiates going into my system. And one of my first questions to my doctor was, am I gonna get addicted? And he looked at me and I'll never forget what he said. He said, don't worry about it, everybody gets addicted. And then in May, when I was finally discharged from the hospital, late May, 
I was addicted to opioids myself. I personally was addicted to opioids. And it took me a while to get off them. It took me a while on methadone to get down from, from this much to this much to this much. And then the last little bit was hard. I was sweating at night, my skin was crawling. And so I have a message for my Republican friends, some of whom have said ridiculous things like, opioid addiction is a weakness. I disagree because I'm a very, very strong man and it was hard to get off opiates. So what we need to do, there's a couple things we need to do. We need to make sure that states have funding and, and prioritization for methadone clinics. We need to help people treat this as a disease and get those folks off of these dangerous uh, illicit drugs and, or illicit drugs. Secondly, we need a reform of how we, we provide oversight to doctors, some of them who are, who are uh, running pill mills, frankly, who are, who are running illicit pain management clinics, and we also need to crack down on the flow of illegal synthetics from both China and across the border in Mexico. And those are things that are killing more Americans than suicide and car accidents on an annual basis. It's horrifying, but it's not weakness, it's a disease. Senator? I, I agree with Mr. Cade on this issue. It is a national challenge and something that we need to do more. This is actually an area where Congress has taken the first couple of steps. They've put out additional funds. They've provided additional um, treatment um, protocols. Uh, there is some, actually, semblance of hope. I'm seeing, you know, one of the potential good things that may have come out a bit of the, um, uh, of COVID is the opportunity to deliver uh, the mental health treatment through telehealth, and, and we've seen a 4,000% increase in, in telehealth usage, which I think is a good thing, and oftentimes mental health may be an area where that can be used. I agree with Mr. Gade, we need to get cut back on the prescription mills, and Congress has acted on that. Um, but I think there is more. I mean, I've sat with all of the, um, the drug courts. I think drug courts uh, are a very effective tool um, that tries to look at not only incarceration, but ways that we can wean people off of drugs through treatment outside of the penal, the criminal justice system. I remember sitting with a number of the drug court judges down in Southwest Virginia where this has been particularly hard hit on, and talking through Sidoxone and some were for, some were against. Uh, I think we're making some progress down there now. Some of the numbers have gotten a little bit better, uh, but this is an issue where actually Mr. Gade and I agree there is more to be done. Uh, it, we need to cut back on the prescription dr drug mills, but there is on this issue a bipartisan agreement in Congress. Dr. Gade? Yeah, you know, uh, Reva, to your point, one of the things that causes people who are already struggling with addiction to slip deeper into addiction and to, and to really uh, put themselves and their families at risk, one of those things is joblessness. And we've seen that happen. We've seen it get worse and worse and worse during COVID. And part of the reason for that is that we haven't had government action that is properly calibrated to provide paycheck protection for people who are out of jobs, to provide uh, protection so that people can, kids can go back to school, so their parents can go back to work. And you know, in Washington, D.C., it's OK to say things like, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, so you get nothing, constituents. I think that's the wrong approach. I think even a flawed bill, as every bill is in some way, even a flawed bill is better than nothing at all. And right now, Virginia families are suffering because they don't have the COVID relief they need. And one of the reasons for that, one of the hundred reasons for that, is sitting right next to me, and that's Mark Warner. And he voted no to COVID relief, and he needs to answer for it. Thank you, sir. Senator Warner, the next question is for you. The confirmation hearings are taking place right now for Supreme Court nominee Judge Amy Coney Barrett. The judge's critics say they worry that if confirmed, Judge Coney Barrett will d uh, d uh, declare unconstitutional the ACA, Roe v. Wade, overturn these precedents, though she insisted today that judges cannot impose their will like royalty. Sunday, the American Bar Association gave Judge Coney Barrett their highest rating, and they said she's well qualified to join the high court. Now, you've had a good relationship with that organization over the years. Does their rating change your opinion of her? I will review uh, Judge Barrett if she gets through the Judiciary Committee. Um, but what I think is, rather than jamming a Supreme Court nominee hurriedly through, you know, while Virginians are actually voting, I think that's a mistake. I think the Senate should be back in session passing substantial COVID relief. 
I was proud of the fact that in the first COVID relief bill, I negotiated with Secretary Mnuchin on the very program that my opponent's talking about, the PPP program. That, while not perfect, did an awful lot of assistance to small businesses. And I think there is more to be done. Now, I will not be vote for a bad bill, and I won't be a rubber stamp for Mitch McConnell, which I guess my opponent is suggesting he will be. And I think I won't do anything that will leave teachers, firefighters, um, cops, airline workers out in the cold. In terms of the Supreme Court, though, I, I am very concerned about this rushing through for a variety of reasons. Yes, the ACA. I think the ACA ought to be improved upon, not repealed the way my opponent does. I think we ought to maintain marriage equality. I think we ought to protect a woman's right to choose and Roe v. Wade. I believe, and I saw this today with a ruling from the Supreme Court, that the census ought to be able to be finished so that all Americans, particularly Americans of color, get accurately counted and we reflect that in our, in our congressional representation. All these and more are at stake. So let's let the American people vote. Let's put in place the Mitch McConnell rule of 2016 when he said you can't vote on a Senator, Supreme Court nominee in we'll the presidential another, year. We'll have another you ought to have that sir. rule work for both Democrats and Republicans alike. And after the you presidential election, seconds, then let's decide who ought to be the next Supreme Court nominee. Dr. Gabe. When I was a kid, we had these little dolls, and you pulled the string, and then the doll would sort of say the same phrase again and again, and every time you pull the string, it says the same thing. And every time you pull the Mark Warner string, he says that I'm for repealing the ACA, and I've never said that, and I'm not for it. We need to up upgrade the ACA. We need to fix it. Now, to the Amy Coney Barrett situation, I agree with 2016 Mark, who I've called Flip Mark. Flip Mark said in 2016 that the president's authority to nominate and the Senate's responsibility to confirm or refuse to confirm a judge goes throughout a president's term. I agree. The Republicans in the Senate erred, and I've said that again and again and again, that they made a mistake. They should have brought Merrick Garland to the floor and given him an up or down vote. Now that Mark said, hashtag do your job. I agree. Now, in 2020, he wants to have it the opposite way. Now he says, whoa, hang on a second. It's too hard to walk and chew gum at the same time. Listen, when I was in combat, I had to answer the radios. I had to fire my weapon. I had to direct my crews. I had to do all of that at the same time. And yet these senators go to Washington, D.C., and they work three or four days a week, and they're, they're struggling to do basic things like let the Judiciary Committee have their hearings while you actually work on the things that we need, like the COVID relief bill, like upgrading the COVID relief bill that he voted down. So again, it's just career politicians saying everything is too hard and trying to have it both ways. They were wrong in 2016 and it's wrong to delay her now. She's a distinguished jurist and I would vote to confirm her. Senator Warner, 60 seconds. I don't think there ought to be one set of rules when there's a Democratic president versus Republican president. And the pure hypocrisy of so many of my colleagues who said, oh, you can't vote on a judge when Obama's president, but now we're going to rush through a judge when Virginians were already voting, I think it's wrong. Just Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a great jurist. You know, I've got three daughters between 25 and 30. They live in a fairer and juster America because of Justice Ginsburg. And so much is at stake if this judge gets rushed through. I'll give her appropriate consideration if that comes to be the case. I still hope I can convince more of my Republican colleagues to say, wait, let's vote. But what is at stake, if you vote for this judge, is the ACA. What is at stake is marriage equality. What is at stake is a woman's right to choose. What is at stake is the Voting Rights Act. And I think these are extraordinarily important, and these laws of the land need to be protected. Thank you. We now go to Joyce with a question for Dr. Gabe. Thank you, Dr. Gade. Americans work hard and pay into Social Security with every paycheck. We must keep Social Security strong so current and future recipients get the benefits they've earned. What is your position on strengthening Social Security for current and future generations? Well, Joyce, I, I appreciate that question, and you are 100% right that for current retirees and near retirees, Social Security should continue with no changes. It's a vital lifeline for those folks, and it's a, it's a planning feature for millions of Americans as they approach retirement age. 
But the problem is, and anybody with an ounce of political courage will tell you this, the problem is that it's unsustainable in the out years, 30, 50, 40 years from now. It's unsustainable and it's going to fall apart under its own weight unless we take action now. You know, it's said that the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago and the second best time to plant a tree is right now. The best time to fix Social Security would have been 30 years ago or even 12 years ago when Mark Warner started his term in the Senate. That would have been fine. We could have prevented very serious changes. And now we're faced with, we're 12 years closer to whatever fiscal catastrophe is on the, on the horizon. So we need to be looking at retirement age for, for people who are younger workers right now. We need to be looking at the funding formula for people who are younger workers right now. We need to be um, examining the premises of the disability program and, and perhaps tightening eligibility rules around certain kinds of disabilities which used to be work inhibiting and, and now they no longer are. And we need to allow workers with disabilities to go back to work in a more meaningful way. All of those things will help us prevent the fiscal crisis. But you know what's not gonna? Is electing the same old people with the same old hollow ideas. And in that, uh, I guess I'm out of time. Ah, sorry. Uh, well, Joyce, you know, with AARP, we've had lots of discussion about this issue over the years. And I took a lot of hits from my people in my own party for acknowledging the basic math around Social Security. You know, again, when I was a kid, 16 people paying in for every one retiree. Now it's only three people paying in because we're living longer. By 2030, it'll be two people paying in. It's just math. So I lay, lay it out very specifically and got a lot of grief. But yes, for folks under 35 years of age, we could phase in an older age over the next 20 plus years at a month every two years. I don't think that would be too traumatic. Second, for folks like me who've done pretty well, we ought to go ahead and raise the amount of income that you can be taxed upon, so-called raising the cap above the roughly $125,000 level it is now. I think those of us who've been blessed to do well in this country can kick in a little bit more. We should do nothing to affect those who are already on Social Security and who are close to being on it, you know, obviously 45 and above. But I think there's even more we can do. We ought to look at the bottom 20% of folks and we ought to raise the Social Security benefit because at the bottom 20%, they're not making enough. Because people are living longer, we ought to increase the benefit as well for folks over 80. And finally, to stop this, I'm working with Mitt Romney on this, every 10 years we need to readjust Social Security so it's solvent for the next 75 years. Common sense, bipartisan approach to make sure we keep our promise. Thank you. 60 seconds, sir. Yeah, you know, another, another feature of uh, politicians is when they get to Washington, D.C. and they get a black eye or they get beat up a little bit, they quit. One thing you'll know about me from a brief look at my personal history, which you can read on gaidforvirginia.com, once you look at my personal history, you'll know this. I will never quit when things are hard. I will never stop fighting for priorities that work for Virginia and work for, for America. I'll just never stop. I'm a fighter and I'll always be a fighter. Now, what you saw here, what he just described, he's right. He did take some flack. He did get beat up by his party, whatever that means in political terms. Maybe they had some mean tweets or something. The truth is, he immediately, after a few black eyes, a few bumps and bruises, he quit trying. And that's why we haven't seen any sustainability bills. That's why we haven't seen fundamental reform. That's why he hasn't pulled together his famous bipartisan group of people to try to solve the problem, because he's afraid of his party. And he always, always, always defaults to loyalty to his party. Thank you. We are running short on time. Our next question will be one minute each, starting with Senator Warner. And Reba has the question. Senator Warner, in the midst of the pandemic, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis has triggered protests in cities across the country, even here in Richmond. It's just steps away right now where we are. Monument Avenue was the site of several clashes between police and protesters. That has led to renewed conversation about policing in America. In Richmond recently, we had two officers who were recently indicted. On the other side, we've seen a number of protesters who were also arrested. The question is, are you concerned about anything that you have seen? And as Senator, what influence can you have on the future of policing? Well, Reba, I want to address this issue, and it was what the, the main subject of our debate in Norfolk State 10 days ago. But I find it a little almost humorous that my opponent keeps calling out that uh, I'm somehow 
I think I just, use the word cowardly. Just behind uh, one party. And you know, I'm, Virginians know my bipartisan record. They know when I was governor, worked with a two to one Republican legislature. I'm really proud of the fact that he, he criticized today my predecessor, John Warner, who served our nation and our commonwealth for five terms. Republican senator, who once again endorsed me for reelection. On the issue of racial disparity, black lives matter. And we need to have meaningful policing reform. And the bill that will provide meaningful policing reform is the Justice in Policing Act. I was proud to be a co-sponsor with Kamala Harris. It will be the most comprehensive policing reform that's out there. I do not support, as my opponent will claim, defunding the police, but I do believe we need the kind of reform that's in Justice in Policing Act. Dr. Gage. So that's great. I'm glad that we're talking about that again, but it seems like uh, maybe you owe Virginia an apology for putting in that budget that did defund the police. Since he says he's not for defunding the police, and he actually did, I guess he owes us an apology. That's fine. I'll wait for that. I'll check your Twitter or something. The truth is that the Police Benevolent Association, the group of people who are, who are helping shape policy for how to keep Virginia safe, they've endorsed me. And in 2008, they endorsed Mark. And the reason that they've switched their endorsement is because they trust me. They believe that I, will, that I will back our police and that I'm the kind of police reform that I'm talking about is the kind that we can all get behind. Of course, we need to have more funding for body cameras. Of course, we need to put whatever we're gonna do with respect to qualified immunity needs to be in law and not in judicially created uh, doctrines. But we need to do that in a smart way that protects citizens and keeps our police who keep us safe, keeps them safe. And we are out of time, sir, and it is time for your closing statement so you can include what you're about to say in that as well. I apologize. Time up for questions. Now closing statements. Well, great. You know, I, uh, this is my first ever campaign. I've never run for anything before, but what I have done is served America and served the Constitution my entire life. From when I was 17 until I was 42, I was under an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so I did that, including at great, grave personal risk, but not the gravest personal risk. When I was in combat, two of my soldiers were killed, a guy named Dennis Miller and a guy named Tyler Brown, both amazing soldiers, both killed in action under my command. I will never forget their sacrifice. I will never forget the sacrifice of those men and women who have laid down everything to make America the great, great country that it is. But as we, as we look forward, Virginia has to make a choice between career politicians who have broken promises time and again, broken promises on COVID, broken promises on prescription drug pricing, broken promises on defunding the police, voted with their party every single time. That's what you've got when you elect career politicians. And if you like what you see in Washington, D.C., if you like what you see in Richmond, if you like the power grabs, if you like the get rich quick schemes off of, off of government funded programs, if you like all of that, then vote for the same people that you've always voted for. But I'm asking Virginia to choose something different. I'm asking Virginia to choose a career servant rather than a career politician. Because when career politicians fail, they fail because they lack courage. You can look at my biography, you can look at my life, and you will know that I'm not gonna fail you. I'm gonna work every day for Virginia and for the Constitution of the United States. That's my promise to you. That's the oath I've been under my whole life. And I hope you'll vote for me and ask your friends to vote for me on November 3rd. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Senator? Well, Bill and Reba and Joyce, thank you for the opportunity to have this debate. You know, Virginia's been so great to me. Uh, I've been blessed to kind of have lived the American dream. First person in my family to graduate from college, Went in business, failed a couple times, then was blessed to do pretty well in cell phones. Um, I decided to go into public service because I wanted to get things done. And I believe over my tenure as both governor and senator, I've had that record of getting things done. Proud that Virginia was named best managed state and best state for business, actually best state to receive a public education when I was governor. Proud of the 55 bills that have become law when, I, when I've served as United States senator. And I have such enormous faith. We're going to get through these challenges. I know my opponent wants to kind of use the tired attack lines time and again. You know, and I'm proud of the bipartisan record that I built both in Richmond and Washington. You know my record. And we will get through this because we lived in the greatest country in the world. 
But if they get through it, we've got to get the coronavirus behind us. We've got to let the science rule. We can't call wearing masks tyranny. We can't say that Donald Trump's done a great job managing COVID when he hasn't. But when we get through it, brighter days are ahead because we're gonna make sure we build a Virginia where every home, and no matter what zip code you live in, you're gonna have access to broadband. We're gonna make sure that the healthcare disparities and economic disparities that are laid bare by COVID get addressed. And part of that will be dealt with with education. Part of that will be dealt with in terms of equality of access to capital. Something again, that I will, will be in the next COVID package that will come through. It also will mean that we've gotta to continue to recognize that the problems we face aren't red and blue. We gotta stop calling each other's names and actually work together. That has been what I've been about in business, as your governor and as your senator. And respectfully, I'd ask to try to earn your vote again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warder and Dr. Gade for engaging in tonight's debate. Public forums are such an important part of our political process and we're very grateful and thank you both and wish we wish you the best of luck going forward. I'd also like to thank the panelists, Joyce Williams of AARP Virginia and my colleague Reva Hollingsworth. Again, the People's Debate has been brought to you by AARP Virginia and WTVR CBS 6. Thank you, the voters of Virginia, for watching Election Day, November 3rd. On behalf of everyone, I'm Bill Fitzgerald. Good night.